Don't forget to subscribe for more exclusive Stoic insights. Leave a comment below sharing your favorite rule or how Stoicism has impacted your life. Remember, the journey to emotional mastery is ongoing, so stay tuned for more content. And guess what? For those who watch until the end, a free Stoic guide awaits you. Subscribe, comment, and share the wisdom. Let's walk the Stoic path together. Have you ever wondered why some people seem unshaken by the chaos of life? In the face of life's many ups and downs, some individuals maintain an extraordinary calm, seemingly impervious to the storms that rage around them. What's their secret? The answer lies in the control of emotions, a skill that can be learned and honed over time much like any other. This trait of emotional resilience is not innate but cultivated. Now you might be wondering, how exactly do I control my emotions? Well, there's a school of thought that can guide us on this journey. It's called Stoicism, a philosophy that originated in ancient Greece and has since been a beacon of wisdom for many. Stoicism champions the idea that we cannot control every event around us, but we can control how we respond to them. It teaches us to focus on the things within our control, and let go of those that are not. Stoicism isn't about suppressing emotions or becoming a stone-cold individual. On the contrary, it's about understanding your emotions, seeing them for what they are, and not letting them dictate your actions or reactions. It's about navigating life with serenity and resilience, no matter what comes your way. When we talk about stoicism, we're talking about emotional intelligence. We're talking about a path to peace amidst chaos, strength amidst adversity. It's a tool that can help you weather life's storms with grace and fortitude. Stoicism is not just a philosophy. It's a way of life, a blueprint for living a balanced and fulfilling life. Remember, emotions like waves are a part of life. They come and go. It's not about stopping the waves but learning how to surf. And stoicism, my friends, can be your surfboard. But stoicism is not a one-size-fits-all solution. It requires practice, patience, and a willingness to delve deep into one's psyche. It's a journey, not a destination. Today we delve into the six brutal stoic rules to become emotionless. But remember, becoming emotionless is not the goal. It's about gaining control over your emotions, not eliminating them. So buckle up, and let's begin this journey together. Scene script. Rule number one, accept what you cannot change. When we talk about acceptance, we're not promoting defeat or complacency. Quite the contrary. We're advocating for a shift in focus, a re-channeling of your energy towards what is within your control. The wisdom to discern between what you can change and what you can't is a key principle of stoicism and a cornerstone of emotional resilience. Imagine you're stuck in heavy traffic, frustration is building up, the clock is ticking and your car isn't moving an inch. You can't control the traffic no matter how much you wish you could. This situation is beyond your control, but what you can control is your reaction to it. You can choose to let the frustration consume you or accept the situation and use it as an opportunity to listen to a new podcast and audiobook, or simply to enjoy a moment of calm amidst the chaos. Think of a time when you faced a setback in your personal or professional life. It could be a job loss, a relationship ending, or a failure in a project. These situations can feel overwhelming, and it's natural to wish things had turned out differently. But dwelling on the past, on events you can't change is like trying to sail a ship by looking at the wake. It doesn't work. It's draining. It's futile. Instead, acceptance encourages us to acknowledge the reality of these situations without letting them define us. It's not about ignoring the pain or the disappointment. It's about recognizing it, understanding it, and then moving forward. It's about turning your gaze from the wake to the horizon, steering your ship towards new opportunities and growth. Consider a challenging person in your life, someone who consistently rubs you the wrong way. You can't change this person. You can't control their actions, their choices, or their words. But you can control your response to them. You can choose to let their negativity affect you, or you can choose to accept them, as they are, and not let their actions dictate your emotional state. In each of these examples, what we're advocating for isn't passive acceptance, it's active acceptance. It's about making a conscious decision to not let uncontrollable circumstances control us. It's about taking the reins of our emotional state, steering it away from frustration, regret, and resentment, and directing it towards resilience, growth, and emotional freedom. Remember, acceptance is not about giving up. It's about understanding the limits of our control and focusing our energy where it matters most. It's about not letting the uncontrollable dictate our emotional state. 
It's about embracing the reality of the present, learning from it, and using it as a stepping stone towards a better future. Acceptance is the first step to emotional freedom. Scene script. Rule number two, see things for what they are. In our journey to emotional control, we must begin to perceive things in their truest form. This is not about adopting a cynical or pessimistic view of life. Rather, it's about embracing the simple, unvarnished truth of our existence, devoid of the colorings of our personal biases, fears, and desires. Consider the story of the farmer and his horse. One day, the farmer's horse ran away. His neighbor said, what bad luck? The farmer only replied, maybe. A few days later, the horse returned with a herd of wild horses. The neighbors exclaimed, what good fortune? Again, the farmer simply said, maybe. When his son tried to ride one of the wild horses and fell, breaking his leg, the neighbors all sympathized. What a terrible accident. Yet again, the farmer responded, maybe. The following week, the army came to draft young men for war. The farmer's son was spared due to his broken leg. The neighbors congratulated the farmer, what good luck, to which the farmer said, maybe. This tale underlines the importance of seeing things for what they are. Events are neutral. They do not carry inherent meanings or emotions. It's our interpretation of these events that assigns them a positive or negative connotation. The farmer, in his wisdom, understood this. He saw each event not as good or bad, but simply as a fact of life, an occurrence in the grand tapestry of his existence. And this is not just about the big events in life, it's equally applicable to mundane, everyday circumstances. Take for instance, a traffic jam. The usual reaction might be frustration or annoyance, but if we see it for what it is, just a bunch of cars on the road, it becomes a neutral event. Our emotional response is then a choice, not a compulsion. Seeing things clearly also means recognizing our own biases and emotional filters. When we're in a bad mood, even a well-intentioned comment from a friend can seem like an attack. Conversely, when we're feeling good, we may overlook a genuine criticism. But if we strip away these emotional layers and view the comment for what it is, just words spoken by another person, we can respond more objectively without being swayed by our shifting emotional tides. In the end, it's about understanding that our perceptions are not absolute truths. They are shaped by our past experiences, our beliefs, and our current emotional state. By seeing things for what they are, we can separate our emotions from our experiences. We can prevent our feelings from dictating our responses. We can choose to react or not to react based on a clear, unbiased view of reality. This is not an easy task. It requires practice and patience. It requires a willingness to challenge our deeply ingrained habits of perception. But the rewards are immense. It's a key step in gaining control over our emotions, in becoming the master of our own minds. Seeing things clearly is a step towards emotional control. Rule number three, live in the present moment. It's not just a catchy mantra or a trendy hashtag, it is a vital tenet of stoicism and a powerful tool in mastering your emotions. The present moment is the only time we truly have. The past is a memory. The future is a projection. Both are illusions that exist only in our minds. Consider this, how many times have you found yourself ruminating over a past mistake or agonizing over a future scenario that may never come to pass? This mental time travel is not only unproductive, it also robs us of the joy and potential that lies in the present moment. By living in the present, we can fully engage with life as it unfolds, rather than being held hostage by our own thoughts and fears. Imagine you're in a conversation with a friend. Instead of truly listening, your mind is elsewhere, replaying an argument from earlier, worrying about an upcoming presentation, or planning your grocery list. You're physically present, but mentally, you're in a different time zone. This not only hinders genuine connection, but also prevents you from fully experiencing the richness of the moment. Living in the present moment allows us to focus on what we can control. We can't change the past nor can we predict the future, but we can choose how we act and react in the here and now. This doesn't mean ignoring the past or future entirely. It means learning from our past without being anchored by regret and planning for our future without being paralyzed by uncertainty. Being fully present also enhances our emotional resilience. Emotions are responses to perceived events, and they're often based on past experiences or future expectations. By staying present, we're able to respond to life as it is, not as we fear it might be. This can help us navigate challenges with clarity and equanimity, rather than being swept away by a tidal wave of worry or regret. Mindfulness, the practice of being fully present, 
is a potent strategy for living in the now. Whether it's focusing on your breath, tuning into the sensations of your body, or simply observing your surroundings, mindfulness brings you back to the present moment. It's like an anchor that keeps you grounded amidst the swirling currents of thought. So, how do we cultivate this presence? Start small. Take a few moments each day to simply be. Notice the world around you, feel the air on your skin, the ground beneath your feet, listen to the sounds that fill the air, taste the food you eat, smell the world around you, engage all your senses, be here now, fully, deeply, completely. Living in the present moment is not about achieving a state of constant zen or emotional flatness, it's about experiencing life fully, without the distortions of past regret or future anxiety, it's about being engaged, aware and responsive, it's about being alive here and now. Living in the present moment keeps us centered and in control. Rule number four, detach from external circumstances. The fourth rule in our journey to emotional mastery is detachment from external circumstances. This rule speaks to the heart of Stoicism, a philosophy that encourages us to realize that our emotional state should not be dictated by the world around us. Let's dive deeper. Imagine you're stuck in traffic, late for a crucial meeting. The tension rises, your heart pounds, and frustration sets in. But consider this. Does the traffic itself cause your frustration? No. It's your response to the traffic, your attachment to the idea of being punctual that leads to your emotional turmoil. Now think of a time when you were anticipating a celebration, perhaps a birthday, or an anniversary. You're excited, joyful, eagerly waiting for the day to come. But does the event itself cause your happiness? Again, the answer is no. It's your attachment to the idea of celebration that brings about those feelings of joy. In both examples, your emotions are tied to external circumstances. But Stoicism teaches us that we have the power to detach ourselves from these external factors. Giving external circumstances the power to dictate our emotions is like giving away the remote control of our feelings to the world around us. Every time something changes in our environment, our emotions flip, like channels on a television. But imagine if you could keep that remote control in your hands, unswayed by the fleeting and often unpredictable nature of the world around you. How do we do this? Firstly, we need to understand that our emotions are not the direct result of external circumstances but rather our interpretation of them. By shifting our perspective we can change our emotional response. Secondly, we need to practice acceptance. Acceptance doesn't mean resignation or defeat but rather understanding that some things are beyond our control and that's okay. Finally, it's about choosing our battles wisely. It's about knowing which external factors are worth our emotional investment and which ones aren't. Not every circumstance deserves our emotional energy. In essence, detaching from external circumstances is about reclaiming the power over our emotions. It's about recognizing that we are not puppets on the strings of the world around us, but rather masters of our own emotional universe. Remember, it's not the events themselves that disturb us, but our interpretation of their significance. It's not the world that shapes our emotions, but how we choose to interact with it. So take back your remote control. Detach from the external circumstances that you've allowed to dictate your emotions. Choose how you interpret and respond to the world around you. Detachment leads to emotional resilience. Rule number five, practice negative visualization. Imagining the worst case scenarios isn't everyone's cup of tea. It may seem counterintuitive, even pessimistic to some, However, in the realm of Stoicism, this is a powerful tool known as negative visualization. It's not about encouraging pessimism, but rather fostering emotional control and resilience. Negative visualization is the practice of visualizing the potential negative outcomes of a situation. It involves imagining what it would be like if we lost the things we value, or if our plans didn't turn out the way we hoped. This technique pushes us to confront our fears and anxieties head on, and it serves a dual purpose. Firstly, it helps us to appreciate what we have right now. Consider this, imagine for a moment that you've lost your ability to see. Suddenly the world is shrouded in darkness. No more sunsets, no more faces of loved ones, no more visual delights. Pretty grim, isn't it? Now, open your eyes. The world is still there in all its vibrant glory. This simple exercise can make you realize the immense value of something as taken for granted as sight. Secondly, negative visualization prepares us for adversity. It's like a fire drill for the mind. Just as a fire drill equips us to handle a real fire, negative visualization readies us for life's inevitable difficulties. Let's take an example. Say you're preparing for a crucial presentation at work. Naturally you want it to go well, 
But what if it doesn't? What if the technology fails, or you forget your lines? Negative visualization allows you to explore these possibilities, and as a result, you can develop contingency plans. And here's the interesting part. When you've already faced your worst fears in your mind, reality rarely seems as bad. This realization can reduce anxiety and increase our ability to cope with stress. Is negative visualization easy? No, it forces us out of our comfort zone, and that's never a walk in the park. But remember, growth doesn't come from comfort. It comes from challenge, from struggle, from stepping into the unknown. Of course, like any tool, negative visualization needs to be used wisely. It's not about obsessing over worst-case scenarios or drowning in a sea of negativity. It's about using these visualizations as a springboard for action and acceptance. So, arm yourself with this potent stoic tool. Practice negative visualization. Embrace it not as a harbinger of doom, but as a catalyst for gratitude and resilience. Remember, stoicism isn't about suppressing emotions. It's about understanding them, controlling them, and using them to our advantage. Negative visualization can help us prepare for and accept life's challenges. Rule number six, reflect and review. Welcome to the penultimate rule in our journey towards mastering our emotions. This rule is all about the importance of self-reflection and review in our quest for emotional control. Imagine you're on a voyage, sailing through the vast ocean of life. Your emotions are like the weather conditions you encounter during your journey. Some days are calm and serene, while others are stormy and turbulent. In order to navigate these waters successfully, you need to regularly check your compass, adjust your sails, and reevaluate your course. This is what self-reflection and review are all about. Let's consider an anecdote to illustrate this point. Imagine a man who finds himself frequently losing his temper. He constantly reacts with anger to situations that don't go his way. One day, he decides to follow rule number six. He starts to reflect on his actions and reviews his reactions. He realizes that his anger often stems from his unrealistic expectations of others. By identifying the root cause of his emotional responses, he's able to work on changing his expectations and thus, his reactions. This simple act of reflection and review helps him gain control over his emotions, turning him from a stormy sea into a tranquil lake. He's still sailing on the same waters, but he's learned how to navigate them better. But remember, self-reflection and review aren't about self-judgment or self-criticism. They're about understanding. They're about recognizing the patterns of your emotions and identifying the triggers that set them off. They're about learning from your past experiences and using that knowledge to shape your future responses. Take the time to pause and reflect on your emotional responses regularly. Ask yourself questions like, why did I react the way I did? What triggered this emotion? How can I respond differently next time? Write your reflections down, if it helps. Review them periodically. You might be surprised at the insights you gain about yourself and your emotional patterns. In the Stoic philosophy, this process of self-reflection and review is considered crucial for emotional control. It's the tool that allows us to become aware of our emotions, understand them, and ultimately, master them. It's like a mirror, showing us not only where we are but also where we need to go. So make it a habit. Reflect on your emotions at the end of each day. Review your progress at the end of each week. Give yourself the chance to learn, grow, and improve. The more you practice this, the better you'll become at controlling your emotions. In conclusion, rule number six isn't just about reflection and review, it's about continual growth and improvement. It's about turning the mirror inward, understanding our emotional landscape and charting a course towards calm and tranquility. Through reflection and review, we can continually grow and improve our emotional control. So, how do we master our emotions? Let's take a step back for a moment and consider our journey so far. We've gleaned some powerful insights from the teachings of Stoicism. They've shown us that we can harness the power of our emotions and use them as tools for personal growth. First, we learned about the power of emotion control. It's not about stifling our feelings but rather understanding and managing them effectively. The key is to respond, not react, to our emotional states. Then, we moved on to accepting what we cannot change. It's a simple yet profound concept. By distinguishing between what is within our control and what is not, we can save ourselves considerable stress and anxiety. After that, we delved into the art of seeing things for what they are. This involves stripping away our biases and preconceptions to view situations objectively. It's about perceiving the world as it is, not as we wish it to be. 
The fourth rule reminded us to live in the present moment. The past is gone and the future is uncertain. All we truly have is the here and now. By focusing on the present, we can make the most of every moment. Next, we learn the value of detaching from external circumstances. Our happiness and peace of mind should not be contingent on things outside our control. Instead, we should find contentment within ourselves. Then, we explored the practice of negative visualization. This is a technique where you imagine worst-case scenarios to better appreciate what you have. It's a powerful way to cultivate gratitude and resilience. And lastly, we emphasize the importance of reflection and review. By regularly examining our thoughts and actions we can identify areas for improvement and make necessary adjustments. As you can see, these six stoic rules are not about becoming emotionless, but about gaining control over your emotions. They offer practical strategies for managing your feelings and reactions. I encourage you to start implementing these rules in your life. Remember, mastering your emotions is not about becoming emotionless, but about not letting your emotions master you.